lecturing at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Moratua, Sri Lanka. He obtained his doctoral degree in semantic computing from the University of Georgia, the USA. His special interest and eloquent practice in advanced machine learning, advanced data science makes him a unique expert in this ever evolving dynamic sciences. Bringing his industrial experience from a globally reputed information retrieval organizations such as Google, Microsoft, uh, from the University of Moratua, Professor uh, Dr. Ube offers a platter on the table for the data-driven leaders of the corporate world. So I would like to invite Dr. Ube Shankar Tayasivam to deliver his keynote address. Over to you, Doctor. Uh, thank you so much. I, I think you should enable me to share the screen. Sorry, we'll do it. Uh... Um, yes. Uh, thank you, Sweeney, for uh, uh, for the kind words and a nice introduction. And uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for welcoming me, uh, granting me an opportunity to uh, present uh, um, my experience and knowledge in big data uh, to you all uh, in the context of bioinformatics. Um, I truly appreciate uh, this opportunity. Um, usually, I, I really hate uh, teaching in you know around the noon because it's the probably the you know, the time where uh, you lack focus, uh, your tummy start to uh, generate acid, uh, reminding you about food or, or sleepy times, right? But um, so I, I'll keep, I'll try my best to keep the talk um, as engaging and as uh, uh, simple and, 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 and fundamental as possible uh, for, the, for the audience to uh, grasp it. And feel free to interrupt me anytime in between. Um, uh, so uh, I should start with a, a bit of a, a story that uh, when when I was uh, entering to my high school, I was given an opportunity to choose either um, uh, biofield or mass field. Um, I choose mass field because uh, not primarily because I uh, love it or uh, not not primarily because I love it. Uh, uh, mostly because I hate biology. I chose maths. Um, here come the karma that I now have to uh, talk to you, a lot of biologists about big data analytics, which is uh, my primary research area uh, in the context of bioinformatics. So uh, I want to put a disclaimer that I'm not an expert of bioinformatics, neither biology, uh, no uh, gene uh, alignment and et cetera. My primary domain of expert come from data science, big data. Uh, that's what I worked uh, in the industry like Google or Microsoft, wherever I go. But I, I do have experience in natural language processing, strong experience in natural language processing, which has a lot of similarities with uh, uh, this field and also coming from semantic web background where ontologies and ontology alignments, uh, I have some uh, you know, intro to this area. Uh, so um, today uh, I'm going to bring you um, uh, big data analytics for bioinformatics um, in this, uh, to begin with, uh, I'll first of all ground myself uh, and the audience here uh, in, in what is big data analytics, is, right? And then, then why we need to do it, especially for the bioinformative context. That, that's, the, uh, that's the primary motivation for this talk. Um, uh, I was told that uh, uh, though there are quite a lot, large number of bioinformatics research has moved into big data, there are still um, some of us, uh, some, some of the uh, uh, listeners here um, uh, you know, needs motivation and, and uh, uh, knowledge and introduction to move into big data technology. So that, that's primarily my focus today. Um, and then I'll briefly touch upon some of the trends in big data in the backdrop, backdrop of bioinformatics. Uh, I, did, I did a brief literature review to bring on some of the things that is going on, uh, especially for the beginners to uh, cling on to one of it based on their you know, research area and, and, and start explore around. And finally, I'll also briefly touch upon cloud technologies for BDA. Uh, I, I am a faculty ambassador for uh, Amazon uh, uh, Cloud Services, uh, Amazon, Amazon Educate. Uh, so um, anybody interested in, in getting to know Amazon Web Cloud Services in this uh, context, uh, please reach out to me. I'll, I'll see what I can uh, to help you on board or even grant you some uh, uh, you know, Educate credit to 
get yourself, yourself familiarized and etc uh, so that is my background um, and um, let me ask like uh, how many of you know big data uh, or or using already one way or the other big data technologies uh, in your in your current research or daily life uh, you know to some extent anybody you you can unmute yourself and let me know or put in the chat as you please uh, okay nishay is claiming that he knows big data right uh, nishay there will be a pop quiz right after this so be prepared uh, grace is claiming that he also knows big data that's good Pras, yes. Okay, that, that, that's good. That's good. Uh, from the, the the team from the JPL also claim that uh, they also know big data. Nice. So let me ask uh, Prash uh, and team. Uh, anybody from that side, like, could you could you give me one use case that you use big data? What technology? Like, uh, before we dive into this uh, talk. Yeah. Yeah. Not really. Uh, thank you, uh, Uday Shankar. Uh, so we we use you know precisely a lot of you know genomic variants. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, try to you know prioritize you know what could be the pathogenic variants you know from 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 a huge list. So Use Hadoop, Spark, yeah. any of those. Uh, the unfortunate thing with uh, prioritizing genomic variants uh, with MapReduce is we tried MapReduce uh, three or four years ago, uh, mm. but you know we couldn't probably uh, get you know uh, the desired uh, outcome, you know the expected uh, results you know, from that. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's also a challenge here. Uh, the inherent challenge here is uh, unlike you know uh, uh, the normal uh, data, you know that. Uh, we use which 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 could precisely be a non bio data in case of genomic variants not, not all data uh, not not all data you know could be uh, extractable you know with feature selection mm -hmm. so that could be a kind of a big you know challenge with genomic variants so that that's probably you know, one of the reasons you know why there's a huge limitation in using map reduce yeah interesting um, so uh, there is a space where, like, I kind of briefly touch upon uh, my produce paradigm, uh, and then uh, we can have a follow-up discussion if, if time permits. Based, uh, you know, uh, to see like um, whether I can be of help in, in that direction. Uh, if not now, maybe offline later. Uh, but thanks for bringing it out. I just wanted to get a pulse uh, of the audience here, like where are we are positioned. Um, so how do I tone my talk? Uh, so as I said, this is um, intended for beginners of the big data, not necessarily for the big data geeks. Uh, so uh, we were, I would like to introduce uh, what is big data, how, how it's kind of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, bring uh, uh, some solutions into the table uh, to tackle specific challenges associated with uh, bioinformatics background and, and specifically in the big data context, right? So to begin with, what is big data, right? That's the first question. Um, so, uh, you know, naturally people think, look at big and they think that something, the, any data that is big is big. But well, well that is uh, true to an extent, but not completely true. Um, the definition of the big data is keep changing. In fact, uh, but more, more widely accepted big data definition is this 4V definition. Um, however, like um, um, the people in the big data community is crazy that they find any interesting property about big data and then try to find a uh, synonymous word for that in start with B and they add to that Q. Um, so nowadays that you can even find 30 V's uh, big data definition online as well. Uh, it's just crazy, but don't worry. You don't need to know all the 30 V's. It doesn't make sense. There are four major uh, V's that uh, you know define big data problems, right? First one is volume, right? As, as, as the size of the data increases, uh, nowadays we talk about zettabytes, petabytes size, not, not gigabytes and terabytes anymore when it comes to big data, because we claim like terabytes and, and, and um, uh, gigabytes are gone, like terabytes are still uh, relatively small for the modern day big data solutions, right? Then you have velocity. That's another part of the problem 
that uh, I, I suppose that um, some of you have may not have not yet encountered in the bio, bio uh, back, informatics background, but it is there in the background as well. The point is that data are streamed nowadays, uh, so it's streamed really fast. Uh, for example, uh, you know, in a second, uh, we we actually tweet in millions, right, all over the world. The number of tweets that are being put put forward are mil in millions number. So, so the velocity is the other kind of problem that big data faces, and how do we solve that, right? Followed by that, then you have variety. Variety means the data is in of different format. Some of them mine. Uh, you know, structured format, some of them are in Im image format, some of them are video, some of them are signals from sensors. They come from various formats and that also another attribute of big data and poses its unique challenges and so there are solutions built around that, right? Then the last part is veracity. So this is something like, you know, if you're working with uh, uh, natural language processing, um, applying natural language processing for, uh, uh, you know, symptoms detection or, or um, you know, mining uh, tweeters, tweets about uh, health products and and diseases and etc. Or or so any social media content for that that matter, and try to extract information out of out of it and try to analyze it. That is where that fourth piece come into the picture that is known as veracity, um, because um, um, just a backstory that big data is a baby of social media companies, right? Um, uh, the, these problems originated uh, with from the social media companies like Twitter, Facebook. Uh, Google, where like um, they faced uh, the, the large scale and velocity or, uh, to begin with, uh, other than the other part of the uh, industries, right? So uh, they uh, yeah, uh, mostly work with user generated content, right? The people share information. Um, on modern day, like we have a lot to share and we just keep sharing as well, right? Like so, so uh, that that um, makes this uh, data uh, to an extent not trustable as well. Now imagine that uh, we are building a bot, uh, scraping uh, you know presidents of various countries and try to create a knowledge, like some political source uh, of truth type of thing. Now we are going to unfortunately scrape Donald Trump as well. Now the question there comes a question mark: Is that information trustable? Right, like that that that's the that's the veracity part of the big data. With what people share is not completely true and not completely trustable. Right, like that's the. Uh, that's one of the attributes of big data. So I was able to obtain this from ResearchGate, uh, this picture which tells, um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, there is a additional, uh, well, uh, you know, we added here 5 e definition is but uh, I was able to obtain, but that does not change the game much. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the backdrop of bioinformatics, uh, uh, you know, how it each definition fits into it, right? You have PubMed and Cosmic as the data set sort of thing, uh, various type of data you get, like you get graph data, you get uh, text data, you get structured, same structured, various kind of data you get. Um, also, like uh, some of the data that you, you obtain also um, come with certain velocity as well. And then uh, there is always a veracity issue, like uh, when it comes to, uh, as I said, user-generated content, right? Um, so, what is big data analytics means, right? Let's let me first define what is data analytics mean, and then uh, take you to big data analytics, right? What you see here is what Gartner came up um, sometimes back, and then now modern day Intel and um, other new companies uh, kind of modified it slightly. There are five different analytics, um, uh, you know, uh, are there in when it comes to this data analytics, right? Uh, first one is known as descriptive analytics. What you do is you take the data and describe the data, like simple as stating, okay, there is this many number of, uh, you know, examples. Um, on average, this many number of people are there. Or, or you know, this is the variance of uh, certain uh, measurement taken uh, in an experiment, right? Those are known as descriptive analytics, very, very powerful, easy to do, um, you know, still you can, uh, you need scalability in it, especially if you're working with zettabyte of information, try to uh, provide, uh, run a descriptive analysis, you need it. Um, mostly batch analysis is what we perform here. Uh, MapReduce, uh, which we mentioned before, which, we, which I will come later, becomes handy there, right? So, uh, this is more like looking at the past and telling what happened in the past, right? That's what the descriptive, descriptive is about. Um, subsequently, the second analysis with the, we do with the data is diagnostic analysis. So what the diagnostic analysis says is why something happened. Okay, you might observe that um, a specific behavior in a measurement is appearing, like there is an outlier. Like usually it's always between 30 to 40, but there is some uh, that measurement, specific temperature measurement for some reason there are like a significant per percentage of uh, 50 
uh, degree Celsius observed or something, right? So then you try to figure out, okay, take only those sample and figure out what is correlating with that, right? So try to explain that. So that is what is diagnostic analysis is about. This is uh, not one shot uh, sort of analysis. You had to drill down, play with it a bit. Uh, this explaining the uh, observation that happened in the past is what is known as diagnostic analysis, right? Um, mostly business intelligence in terms of business applications, that's what they call. And a majority of this data uh, that involved in diagnostic analytics and descriptive analysis are one way or the other structured data, right? Then uh, if you go to predictive analysis, right? That is what is modern day machine learning is. So predictive analysis is all about predicting some an unknown. There are two kinds of unknown usually we try to predict. One is uh, in the time axis, right? The, something that is going to happen in the future that we are not aware can be predicted, right? That is what is uh, known as time series analysis uh, sort of a thing. Can we predict an event that is going to happen in the future? Can you try to you know, predict the uh, specific measure, um, the specific value a measure is going to take in the future, right? That is one kind. The other kind of predictive analysis is what is uh, you know known as uh, uh, can, can we can we predict an unknown uh, that is not there for us right it is not necessarily in the future sort of thing to give you an idea uh, uh, you know um, uh, predicting a disease uh, of a of a person based on some of the sim symptoms and signals we already got uh, which is like if you had to detect that using uh, some traditional ways might be like you know inversive or might, might be time taking costly uh, can we do a machine learning algorithm with limited signals uh, you know can we um, uh, predict that um, that he's already sick with this sort of thing right or image image processing applications are there like uh, you know people apply uh, uh, that on um, uh, scans uh, and, and x-rays and various uh, images to, uh, to predict uh, an unknown that is not yet there Right. That is predictive analysis. That is what the machine learning, a lot of hype about it. Um, and then the fourth one is the prescriptive analysis. Uh, prescriptive analysis is about like, uh, you know, uh, you, you actually uh, try to come up with a solution that best fit for a given problem, right? So this is a relatively advanced uh, solution uh, space where you uh, will basically uh, engage in, uh, you know, so simulation solutions. You will uh, try out, simulate a more re, uh, real world environment and trying out various options to see which option is going to pay you off. Uh, that is what is uh, broadly known as uh, prescriptive analysis. Um, the fifth one, that is the new uh, addition to this, up to until fourth one is what Gardner uh, uh, pitched like, uh, like five years, seven years ago. Uh, the cognitive analysis is one of the recent addition. Uh, what is the cognitive analysis is that uh, human brain, uh, you know, like uh, decision making. So we are like high performance computing is required, deep learning models are running, uh, which helps to make decisions or, or uh, su suggest uh, solutions, which is very close to human analysis, right? In prescriptive, you don't really uh, get a solution. You only get a solution analysis, risk analysis type of thing. In cognitive, you also go ahead and uh, kind of make a decision in it, right? So uh, as you go from descriptive to cognitive, uh, there are two things that changes. One is the value um, that is added to a, a process or a business increases, right? Um, other thing is that the complexity that is required to do that analysis also increases. So uh, that is basically, broadly speaking, um, what is what are the different types of data analysis? Uh, and now, what is big data analytics? Quite simply speaking, if you take all these analytics to the big data, you will be faced with uh, challenges of uh, based on the properties of the big data that what uh, solving that what is known as big data analytics is basically performing these five different analytics that the data analytics uh, to big data is what is known as big data analysis it's simple as that however uh, the solution is not simple as that right um, majority of the uh, you know computing libraries that initially built were not meant for big data the, you know especially the machine learning libraries and, and uh, diagnostic analysis and uh, uh, on, onward. Descriptive analy analysis, like they were not necessarily meant for big data, but one of the easiest uh, to first to add up uh, com in comparison to others, but there are still some challenges in, involved in that too. So when the data become a big data, especially in terms of volume, you are facing with the problem of scaling. Okay, now I had, I used to work with like 10 GB, 20 GB data. Now I have terabytes and gigabytes and sorry terabytes and uh, zettabytes of data uh, so how do i solve that problem my, my laptop cannot have uh, you know allow me to just 
copy the data itself, right? Uh, even if I copy, now my memory is too small to handle. Like how do, how do I process it? Even to just to calculate a sum from a really large values of numbers, uh, you know, it is going to take a, a really long, long time, right? So how do I do that? Like that's what is the problem of volume. The second problem that you are faced with is velocity, right? That is that um, as some of the data comes at speed, can I make a decision in real time, near real time, right? So if you are not going to make a decision in real time or near real time, yet you are you are good. Like you you are you will fall back to only that volume uh, problem, not to the velocity problem. The third one that you're going to deal with is variety problem that that um, at some cases that you get uh, data from different sources that need to be merged to make a decision or, or perform an analysis. One could be a structured data coming as a comma separated value. Uh, another could be um, uh, images that is coming or, or maybe even, uh, you know, uh, JSON, like fundamental different formats to complex uh, different data set to be merged, right? How, how do I do that type of a thing? Uh, so that is known as the variety uh, problem of the big data. As you can see, the fourth part is veracity, of course, like the quality, the trustworthiness around the data, and how do we make this? And especially, as I said, uh, when you perform uh, NLP applications where like you mine, uh, you know, user-generated content, user-recorded content, and try to use that to uh, arrive at a decision. So tackle with volume, right? What There are two solutions uh, that were explored. One is vertical scaling, other one is horizontal scaling. Vertical scaling means like, okay, instead of doing it in our laptop, we buy a reasonably large server, we submit our job to that server, server performs the solutions and give the solution back to us, right? Um, increase size of, uh, you know, RAM, increase uh, size of CPU cores, uh, larger hard disk and we buy a big server, right? Now, that is one side of solution. Other side of solution that known as horizontal scaling came reasonably late in the, into the picture. Uh, where like we actually buy a bunch of small computers, connect them through internet, let them talk to each other through internet. So that will give you like a big server type of a view, but they don't really are a big server. Uh, there is obviously one challenge that comes with horizontal scaling is that those computers have to talk to each other to work, do the work together over the internet, right? Over, over the uh, network. That's the major thing to be done or, or you know in terms of horizontal scaling major solo bottleneck to be uh, uh, crossover however there are other benefits that it provides like for example if one of the you know computer is down for some reason or it, it crashed or it has corruption issues you can still perform with the rest of it you're not completely down but in the in the left hand side if for some reason power fail if one, any one issue is there the whole thing is down right it, it's no more norm, normally uh, known as single point of failure other than that, horizontal scaling has other benefits too. It's actually cost effective. Uh, it's relatively uh, you know, easy to scale because like, let's say that you bought a big server and now you decide, okay, that is not enough that you need something more. You need to increase the capacity by 50%. You can't simply add another 50%. You may need to sometimes buy a completely new uh, server, but here adding 50% means just buy uh, you know, four more computers and add to that uh, network, you're done. Right. So scaling is really easy in horizontal scaling um, and, and it made uh, a lot more viabilities with uh, failures and etc. So that started to become popular. So modern day big data solution, every other solution that you know are meant or sorry, are built on top of horizontal scaling, not based on um, vertical scaling. Right. So with how do we tackle velocity when, when we have an information that uh, that is uh, you know coming to at, uh, us at a really uh, you know large speed and we need to tackle it? How do we solve that? There are two ways we solve it. One is batch processing. Batch processing means like we don't solve for every other you know data point that is coming. We just accumulate it for like hundred or one minute. You know you can either accumulate by number or accumulate by time and then do a batch processing. The other one is known as stream processing, where with queuing technologies, like you kind of process almost uh, real time on your real time type of a thing. Uh, these are the major two approaches uh, that we take for velocity. Um, now, uh, I'll give you an example of this, uh, which most of you know. Like, uh, imagine that uh, somebody liked your picture in Facebook, right? So, in a in a given second, how many people you think will like a picture in Facebook? You know, all around the world. In which order? Any idea? In a given second? Any cases?
Okay. Uh, I mean, um, I'm used to teach to silent classes, especially as the, after the COVID remote teaching, but uh, I, I thought you guys would be a little more engaging. Then. Uh, there is someone in the chat. Thanks. Uh, people who highly engage with our post. Well, Gajanan, well, that, that, that they will like your page. I'm saying, you know, if you are the Facebook owner, like in all the all the people who are clicking likes in Facebook application all over the world, right? There will be like billions of users of Facebook, right? So how, in a given second, in what, one second on average, how many people might click like? Right? It's actually in the orders of millions. Millions of people uh, will click like button right or some kind of engagement in the, in a in a facebook image let's say right so if you are going to get millions of such events in a second and then you simple you know processing as delivering that you know event to that person who has posted let's say that i liked gajanan's uh, 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 you know image i sh gajanan should be notified immediately about it right so they need a system does no intelligence much except to, uh, you know, looking at the event, deciding who should be notified and then see whether Gajanin is currently online in his, uh, you know, mobile or, or uh, you know, desktop, see whether he has enabled desktop, uh, you know, notification and just click, uh, you know, give, pass it to him. Such thing itself is very challenging, right? To do that, uh, there are some known architectures known as alpha and um, gamma. Uh, there is uh, some modification to this as well. These are these kind of architectures are well, very well uh, built already in modern cloud solutions, and you can repurpose it. Um, you can look at the same thing, right? If you are building, let's say, a sensor network uh, for some uh, sort of plants or animals, even humans, and that sensors keep sending signals, and you want to process the signals and create some sort of a notification from that sensor uh, sensors, you need such a technology. Now, good thing you don't need to rebuild the technology. The technology is reasonably well built. And out of the box, you can just uh, take it up and hook it up, right? Uh, mo most of the modern days IoT devices, they kind of go into this type of solution. I purposefully did not give the details of alpha and gamma because there's a little too, too complex for the uh, ad advanced solutions to be explored. But if you are interested, if you go to any cloud service, not only Amazon, even for Google, they pre-baked it and give it to you. So you can hook up one way the notification and other side, you can say what you want with this, uh, you know, this data streaming that you're getting, uh, they will, you know, help you with notifications or anything of that sort, if you want to build it up. Variety and veracity. So variety poses uh, two, uh, one major challenge to the big data, as I said, the data integration. Um, and another thing is master data management, right? Data integration means that, okay, you get two information, two different sources, no, one is sending images relevant to the same uh, phenomena. Another one is sending some textual records or some sort of comma separated values about the same phenomena, right? Both are coming, both has the same ID, but both are coming from different sources. Now you need to, you need to merge them. And as I said, the, you know, they are not coming from the same sort of sources that you buy. So they have their own standards and techniques. How do you integrate this data? How do you, you know, make a unified view of both the information so that then you can do some sort of processing on top of it. That itself is very challenging uh, when it comes to big data, right? One kind of challenge. The other challenge is, now initially I said image and the text, right? Suppose like both of them are giving information about experiments, like two different big companies working on the same kind of experiments in their labs. They keep posting experimental results into their, into their DB. You can, you know, actually get to know that information. Um, uh, you know, uh, and use it. Suppose they might have worked on the same experiment. They uh, X company might have recorded a metadata relevant to that. That is, uh, uh, you know, uh, has different labels and Y company also recorded, but different labels. They might overlap to an extent. They may have unique information separately also. Uh, now the question comes, right? You don't want duplicates. You wanted to merge them in a way that you want one final single copy. Right? You don't want duplicative information, right? It is not necessarily they will do it at the same time, the same experiment also. So this makes another different problem altogether at big data that is known as master data management. How do you create a master data? Single source of truth that give you the one unique view of the whole world rather than multiple different informations with duplicate and et cetera. Right? That's, that is one issue to be, one big issue that we need to tackle. There are solutions for it, but these solutions are very expensive to work with and as well as you need some domain expert to configure with as well. Veracity, I have said, like it comes from user-generated content. Uh, uh, so natural language processing nowadays also have 
way to look at the truthfulness of of the uh, post uh, have been posted there are uh, several technologies that have been created to validate whether what is said, said is true or not automatically not uh, in a, you know so uh, again they have not completely successful like i mean i wouldn't say that they are 100% date foolproof uh, but they are evolving like they are, a certain domain it works well and certain domain that doesn't work well and stuff like that sentiment analysis is another way to figure out like um, uh, you know what the people saying is uh, to to and what text and we can trust it and etc uh, because from sentiment analysis we also go to emotion analysis nowadays so that also helps uh, and emotion analysis is the newer version of the sentiment analysis Uh, mostly psychological uh, field people are very much interested uh, you know analyzing um, emotion analysis on top of uh, uh, people's um, uh, social media post helps them to profile them uh, with regard to some psychological behavior and etc so how do they solve uh, this kind of problem there are three solutions that uh, nowadays uh, uh, modern day uh, you know uh, solution providers uh, suggest uh, one is um, Uh, crowdsourcing right but you kind of don't uh, go to social media in, instead of that you go to vetted people who have been uh, you know uh, gone through certain process to uh, guarantee the trust that you require there is one way to gather the data the other way that you do is sample vetting that means like um, you don't actually go and verify everything that you collected maybe sample of it or you independently do a market research and see whether what you have done is aligned with uh, what the big data complete details type of thing so there are various ways to verify the trust part of it uh, not necessarily to solve it per se except for crowdsourcing which is one of the way to solve it like other two are like more like verifying whether the trust is there or not the first one is more towards like solving the trust to an extent right so what we looked at so far is we looked at what is big data uh, we looked at what is data analysis and subsequently we said big data analysis means taking data analysis the five quadr- uh, you know uh, types of data analysis and apply it on top of big data so when we apply each properties of the big data there is the four v's that we are looking at poses their own challenges and how we are solving in the technological space is what i uh, touched upon right um um sir you're on mute uh and okay. sorry i think i got disconnected let me connect again yeah sure okay yeah. so i was um i i was i was mentioning that um, there were um five type of big data in the bioinformatics context as per this journal it it was a little old but uh, i think still useful to uh, get ourselves uh, understood like how, how we can use big data in our in our research uh, one is as i said gene expression data the other one they point out is dna rna and protein sequence data third one they are pointing out protein the protein interaction data the fourth one is the pathway and then finally the gene ontology which comes with some graph structure as well right so these are the five different uh, data the, the goal as i said is to see whether your current work how does it fit to big data and and, and find a way to transport uh, from a regular and uh, like a single compute analysis to big data analysis so uh, these are uh, some of the big data problems they are uh, pointing it out uh, one they call out is micro array data analysis uh, 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 the other one is g to g network analysis uh so the first one is uh, scale problem second one is again uh, network analysis means some sort of a graph solutions are required uh, then pbi data analysis uh, the third one uh, the fourth one is uh, sequence analysis uh, the fifth one is evolutionary research uh, uh, and then uh, you have pathway analysis 
and then disease network analysis, right? So uh, the major solution space I see that bioinformatics people are interested. In. One is they uh, they really use a lot with uh, graph database solutions. We will we'll talk about what is graph database means in a moment. And the other one is the traditional big data solutions like scaling, uh, you know, in terms of storing the data and processing the data. How do we uh, store big amount of data and process them faster is the other solution space that they explore. These are the two dominant pieces I, I, I observed uh, in, the, in, a, in, a, in, the, in the brief literature I conducted, right? So with that backdrop, uh, so we kind of set ourselves with uh, what is big data, what is big data analysis is uh, relevant challenges and some pointers to understand how bioinformatic data is connected to it, right? Let me introduce you to the fundamental technology of big data that every other big data technology is built upon, right? All of you know what is a file system. If you don't know, don't worry. I'll tell you what it is. What is a file system means, right? All of you who has a computer has worked with a file system. Okay, think about your file explorer, right? The one that you go to my computer in those double click, you get what, uh, you know, known as a file explorer. That is nothing but a file system, right? Uh, in, if anybody who has learned computers in the early 90s would have started their computer learning with file system like DAR, MKDAR command, make directory command, delete command, you know, trying to do it through command line, right? That's what you would have done um, uh, if, if it is, um, um, you know, sometimes back, right? Uh, now, uh, the file system that we know is built for a single computer, which most likely have one hard disk, sometimes would have have two hard disks, it's still fine, but you will be given just a one logical view of the whole hard disk as file system. It is organized as directories and within the directories, maybe subfolders under the first folders, further subfolders and finally files, right? That's broadly what you do. Now, distributed file system is the first technology that we built when it comes to big data. What it does is it takes multiple computers, it uses the their hard disk, all the hard disk they have given, and give you a logical view of all the hard disk together. Right? That is what is known as distributed distributed file system. Uh, originally, this was invented by Google, and then Apache uh, open source adopted it, and that is what is known as Hadoop. They named it after that mammoth elephant, the big elephant uh, that is known as Hadoop. Right? So, what it does instead of looking at uh, my, you know um, uh, one uh, small computer you know you can connect multiple computers together and think of it as a big gigantic hard disk and upload data and delete data uh, do you can run command like ls dir all kind of traditional file system commands that's the first thing they did okay now you have found a way to fundamentally take uh, uh, you know multiple computers and look like a big computer at least at the file system level Next thing is like, how do I run processing on top of it? Because what you can simply do with the file system is listing the file, deleting the file, editing the file, that's all, right? If you want to do something more, something more intelligent than that, you need something more than that. And that is where they introduce MapReduce. MapReduce is actually a very fundamentally speaking, nothing but a, a, a programming paradigm. It is. It, it, it actually works well, very well within a single computer as well. It is nothing to do with distribution to begin with, right? What it says is basically, instead of solving a bigger problem altogether, try to chop it into small problems and find similar small problems and solve it. That's all my produce does, right? So if you look at this, right, there are three uh, uh, pieces of problems that are given, which has sub problems, uh, which has some sort of over overlapping uh, fashion that's what the colors are indicating during the map phase what he does is we take the bigger problem we chop it out right and put it out that's it right we chop it and put out but when we chop it and put out we actually identify the sub problem by uniqueness so like if you look at it there are three nodes in that map phase of the map produce the left hand side i'm talking about right in that side one thing that you need to um, you know here this side I'm talking about, right? So this guy is actually one computer connected to another computer here, right? Through internet. C1 and C2. You have a giant file that is now broken into pieces, three pieces and stored in three different hard disks. Logically, it will be given like a one file view for you, but physically it is stored separately. 
Now, what the computer have to do? Like it takes this file and chop it up, right? It chop it up and point out. But while chopping, it knows these two are of the same problem. That knowledge should be there, right? Same here. So they should point out that orange is actually orange problem. When you go to reducer, right? When you go to reducer, you will be given all the sub problems of the same type together. Like for example, all the blue sub problems comes together, all the orange sub problems come together, and all the yellow sub problems come together, right? This grouping, right, from original problem to when you chop it out, grouping part, this intermediate part is known as shuffle. This is what a MapReduce solution uh, a framework will do it for you. You don't need to do it. It's already done for you. What you need to do is then you have to tell how to chop and what is the sub problem should look like. Then you have to tell the MapReduce framework. Once I get a reduce, uh, you know, get to the reduce in space where all the sub problems are collected together, how do I solve them together? That's totally up to you. You can solve only one and ignore other if you want. You can solve all of them together if you want, depending on the type of problem that you solve. Um, there are various beta adaptives. And this is what is known as MapReduce. It nicely scales well in a distributed setup, as you can see, and help us to solve. You can chain one, one MapReduce after the another MapReduce and so on and so forth as well. Right? So that is, what, that is how the big data solutions looks at uh, large problems and try to solve it. So we know like how to store the data, fundamentally speaking, that we have come up with a way to now process the big data. The second thing, the third thing that you should know is Spark. Now MapReduce is relatively old. Modern day people go to Spark and why they go to Spark. Main reason they go to Spark is that Spark is proven to be 1000 times, to 10,000 times faster than MapReduce. It's really, really fast than MapReduce. Why? because it actually uses memory instead of hard disk when it comes to processing, right? So subsequently, Sparks, if you are going for a Spark solution, be aware that you need uh, reasonably uh, large memory computers, right? Unlike uh, Hadoop situation where you need, uh, you don't need that much of memory compared to Spark, right? So like sometimes several hundred GBs of memory we are talking about. Right, but that's the that's a trade-off here. Nothing is a free lunch, right? Like so, Spark actually is a technology that can work very well within the memory. It has found a way to work with the memory and get around the volatile issues. That suppose, like let's say, the power goes, but you store in the hard disk still persists, but but you store in the memory is not persisted, right? So you find a way to work around that and stuff like that. But still, um, it needs large amount of memory. That's the point number one of it. But Subsequently, it gives you speed that is like immense compared to Hadoop. Hadoop itself was speed when you try to process like terabytes of data only, you'll realize uh, how MapReduce is, you know, actually helping. But if you go to Spark, you'll realize Spark is way more faster than MapReduce. The other thing about Spark is polyglot. What is polyglot mean is basically you, if you know R or Java or Python, right, or Scala, like any one of the technology that is good enough for you to work with Spark. You don't need only one, uh, you don't need to know all different uh, languages or, or anything specific type of thing. This is to an extent true to MapReduce as well, but Spark actually took a gear on this and kind of now outperformed MapReduce. So internally Spark still use MapReduce. Remember MapReduce is not, a, not thrown out, but people started to wrap things around it and give you some sort of an easy way to work with it, right? Uh, as you can see, it, it is Spark internally uses Hadoop and uh, MapReduce, right? So other than this, Spark comes with uh, several other solutions too. Like, I mean, it, it has specialized machine learning library called MLib. Uh, it does uh, high scale machine learning if you are interested. It has specialized library for graph processing. Uh, it does a really amazing job and fast job at um, processing graph uh, and give you information, you know, uh, knowledge about graphs and analyze it, et cetera. Uh, also, if you have streaming data, Spark also has a special plugin for that. Uh, that also works for you, right? So, so Spark is the 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 more the happening thing nowadays in big data. But it comes comes with the caveat that only you go to Spark when you can afford the memory. Otherwise, you just uh, fall back to MapReduce and stay with that. Now we looked at some of the fundamental technologies uh, that is uh, you know, uh, needed for you to get on uh, speed with uh, big data. 
let's broadly look at how how a data pipeline works i, I think this is something you might know reasonably well because uh, if you have worked with some sort of data in in bioinformatics either whether it's big data or or so you know uh, single computer data doesn't matter you would have gone through this process you will be given some raw, raw data right you need to clean it there will be some uh, values that are missing some values that are misleading some of them are outliers so you have to you have to do some sort of cleaning and and pre processing then you need to do transformation in 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 a, in business terms we know we call it etl right uh, etl process um, um, you you may get different formats of the data and then you need to you know convert it into one format that you want finally and that is where the data integration happen right so you now have a integrated master data sort of view one view data then you can perform analysis before that you may want to store somewhere right uh, so no sql come we will touch briefly upon no sql as well and then you do the processing that is interpreting it and finally what you interpret you get into visualization data visualization this is the classic pipeline of any big data analysis right so uh, we have looked at some of the big data uh, you know problems or analytics uh, some uh, in the previous slide as well i just want to reiterate that uh, all this uh, uh, analysis that you know, generally perform around bioinformatics data uh, are nowadays available in big data solution space uh, some of them are pre pre made for you some of the solution space are pre made for you you don't really need to like kind of ground up build it uh, some of the tools are very well uh, developed specific for some specific uh, solutions uh, sorry for some specific problems in this space right uh, micro data analysis uh, gene to gene network analysis pbi uh, sequence analysis evolution research pathway analysis uh, disease network you 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 name it like uh, what they what they claim is that um, uh, the technologies are nowadays built for it right so here's the so i, I really not not the expert of all these bioinformatics problems per se but i kind of know how that technology fit into uh, in terms of big data i just wanted to be uh, cautious here because this is actually something i uh, borrow from the science direct all right so here is one thing i found that i, I think some of you might be interested if you are not aware of it before uh, these are some of the existing tools in, in big data tools for bioinformatics uh, or, or parallel processing type of thing uh, for example genomic sequence mapping uh, cloud boss is there in um, aws as well uh cloud and align risk there some of you might know it uh, seal uh, blast reduce uh, you know if you come to genomic sequencing crossbow uh, contrail um, you know uh, these these are there like i mean um, um, and, and 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 if you go for each one of it there are like multiple such things and you can you can see in this in this table they are using big data technologies excuse me right it's a distributed assembler cloud brushes and 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 so on and so forth i really couldn't find anything uh, you know in spark that is like very popular and widely used uh, correct me if i'm wrong if anybody knows any technology or any tools in spark that is widely used in this area please do let me know as i said i'm not a bioinformatics researcher per se personally so i'm happy to take that feedback from you or input from you but this is a nice list this is a, this is from a survey legit uh, literature survey that was uh, uh, you know uh, available in um, uh, in so this was done in india i believe this literature survey i had the author's name somewhere sorry i missed it so just to wrap up like uh, i i 10 minutes to 45 minutes okay i, I think i am on time uh, just have five more minutes to go i may i may over uh, beyond time or i may let me know where i'm with timing um doctor if you can finish it in about 5 or 7 minutes yeah you i can wrap it up oh, in 5 minutes thank you i just have one more thing to mention so one one last thing about big data that uh, if you are getting into know you should know is no sql basically this is a uh, similar to databases that you are aware of like uh, oracle or postgres or whatever that you might have heard of before if you go to big data like database of data and want to store how do you store it there are four type of solutions one is column family other one is graph uh, databases other the third one is document databases the fourth one is key value store these are the four uh, no sql uh, databases that are ideal for big data right 
So why we call it uh, NoSQL is is actually not only in the SQL. Okay, it's not like we don't want SQL. We want something new. Uh, it's short in form for uh, not only SQL. Please remember that. So uh, column family is basically like if you have a data uh, and instead of storing row by row, that is how traditionally what Excel does, what other databases does. This will store certain columns together and another set of columns in a separate place together, right? Because uh, this is very variable for big data simply because big data has this concept of sparsity. Right? They don't have values uh, in, in records for all the columns. In, 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 you know, in real world, that, ha that happens a lot with big data. To tackle that sparsity issue, only they go for this uh, technique, uh, which helps a lot with uh, you know, saving space and also processing faster. Right? So uh, if you are going for such solution, only thing that you need to worry about is how do I divide my columns such a way my processing is going to be improved. That is, your, you have to decide if you're going for the solution, right? Key value store, very popularly, uh, very popular solution in big data technologies, uh, mostly in the web, web front-end development type of thing. What, what it is, is nothing but like a hash map. Very simple, you keep a key and, and the whole document has a value. Uh, you know, for example, that I, you know, you can store it like user one position, user one name, like independently uh, creating some sort of a, a like a domain name type of a key, like a, you know, larger user then position dot. Uh, for example, user one dot name dot uh, last name dot first type of thing. You can create key like that also, or else alternatively, the other way to look at it, the key value store is you just keep one key, whole values dump into the value, like name, position, everything is dumped into one value, and then you process. Uh, this 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 will be nowadays as i said it will run in multiple nodes so can hold terabytes of key values right you can quickly look up uh, things really fast uh, from a terabyte of information right imagine if you want to do like terabytes of information in one computer loading it into a memory and quickly look up by a key no way you can do it right that's the that's the key here that's the that's the point why what that uh, key value stores are going to provide um the other one is uh, uh, Document stores. Document stores basically what it does is that um, if you have a key value in, in the key value store, you can only search by the key. But if you have a problem where like or, or you are looking for a solution where you also want to search by values, uh, keys of the values. Like for example, in the previous case, like okay, you uh, instead of searching only by uh, user, uh, if you stay, uh, you want to search by user position. Uh, user as name sort of uh, like very very fine grain uh, you know uh, searching is required then uh, they suggest you go to uh, go for a document uh, uh, database solution these are again meant for large scale uh, and uh, can support uh, in a distributed setup right finally the graph databases right graph dbs are very popular now one thing i want you to understand about graph databases it is relatively smaller than the other size the data sizes like sometimes graph database if you store you know keep it in a hard disk it will be like only several gbs but it becomes a big data problem mainly because of the structure right as soon as you make it into a graph processing graph uh, into find out let's say like i want to find a pathway from one one of the gene right uh, here g1 how it is connected to uh, one of this uh, cancer C1. Is this connected? If it's so, what is that path? This, right? If you're talking about a graph with thousands and thousands of nodes, this is going to take a long time in a computer, in a simple computer. And that is why we go for distributed solutions, right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, uh, graph database are very popular in bioinformatics uh, solutions uh, there are multiple graph database solutions out there most of it come from again a big you know social media companies because they had their graphs like friend of a friend right you know they keep he is a friend of this person is a friend of that person who likes this page and stuff like that right that's 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 their uh, they are bread and butter so they created solutions for uh, that like neo4j uh, is graphql uh, these these are technologies that are created for such purposes and available for you right so finally one uh, last thing i would like to tell you like if you're going into big data you should consider cloud why you should con consider cloud is cloud is cheap if you want to get this technology installed in your role in your local uh, uh, clusters it takes a lot of knowledge experience maintenance and etc but if you go to cloud it's one click they not only rent you the hardware they not rent you the platform as well as the software right everything is managed for you so uh, versions are automatically updated and etc you only pay until you use it once you 
use it, you can just say that I don't want it anymore. Tomorrow morning only I'll be used. So next week, one hour only I knew, I will use it. So you can actually pay only for the amount of time that you use. So that way also it's really cheap. Right. So that's why you should go to uh, cloud. There are a lot of benefits of cloud due to the time. I, I, I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to uh, skip that part of it. But I would like you to know that if you go to AWS, right, they have a special built Ubuntu for 64-bit Ubuntu for, uh, uh, you know, bio uh, Linux, they call it, with Blast, in, you know, set up already, uh, Glimmer, uh, um, uh, uh, up to, uh, you know, uh, several other uh, you know useful packages are pre pre built for you pre set up for you you don't need to install one click it is getting ready for you right so uh, they also support uh, special uh, such pre built uh, uh, computer nodes to rent uh, for cloud burst as well as crossbow these are three things i was able to find in aws there may be more but uh, uh, with my limited experience uh, these were the things that i am aware that that is out there uh, if you guys know more feel free to chip in uh, or uh, let me know if you have a specific problem that needs, uh, I will I will can circle back with my friends at AWS and see if they, if they can find a solution for you. Uh, so uh, if you want to get to know more about uh, me or, or, the, or the researchers that we do, we do some uh, bioinformatics relevant research like we, we did some image processing to understand uh, crop diseases. Uh, we, we also perform uh, uh, mobility modeling to understand how um, uh, dengue or COVID spreads uh, su such researches have been being conducted at our research lab at Mojo University of Maratua, uh, known as Data Search. This is a research lab where we perform big data and data science uh, research. Uh, this is an open source organization I lead where like some of our uh, efforts are being open sourced. And if you want to know more about me, you can check my uh, personal website. Uh, that's all for today. Uh, uh, thank you. I hope that was useful and happy to take uh, questions now. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for that very informative talk. So uh, if there are any questions from the audience, you may ask now. Uh, either I, I was an excellent presentation or uh, there was an excellent presentation with no doubts <laughs> or nothing went through. Oh, they may be hungry now looking for a lunch break. <laughs> uh, take it easy. I mean, if you don't have a question, I, I, I think no point in forcing you, but um, feel free to email me also later if you um, feel like. Oh, there's a I question. There's the one question on the chat, uh, sir. Good, um... Yes, in streaming line, if speed is only matter instead of uh, spark, can't we use uh, fling uh, foundation? So, so here is the thing, uh, Gajana, Like I introduced spark as one that is the most popular solution when it comes to processing, uh, rather instead of MapReduce. But when it comes to streaming, spark is not the only one, right? Streaming solution again, like uh, spark also supports streaming processes, stream processing. There are other solutions like flink, but if you want to only look for uh, simple QA, QN process, you can look for Kafka. There are like uh, like 10 to 12 solutions I can think of uh, that are relevant to streaming. And they have their own, uh, you know, strength and weaknesses and use cases to pitch in. So uh, I would uh, sort of stay a little away from recommending one solution or the other without knowing exact solution, you know, problem. However, as I said, Spark is, Spark supports streaming, but I don't say Spark is not only uh, solution for streaming. Sorry, uh, Shinkar, uh, it is Ayam Gupta who is here uh, at BAS. Yes. He is my PhD fellow. So he has uh -huh. this question, please, you know, for you. Go ahead. How, uh, yeah, I can see it in the chat. Uh, how difficult is it to deploy cloud based solution like AWS of GCP for biological data analysis? Uh, so uh, here is a thing, uh, uh, um, Gupta. Like, uh, uh, can I call it Gupta? Hope it's okay. Uh, so, so, so here is the deal, right? There are some solution. They are pre-baked, pre-packaged for you. 
um i know that there is something some sort of uh, private companies also that supports uh, so you know biomed uh, uh, medical solutions so what they do is one click setup in aws so basically you go uh, you select the computer node like with this much memory this much hard disk type of options you had to choose and then uh, you choose this software is what i want with one click everything set up boom Uh, within minutes it's ready for you you only need to then now go and upload the data and start processing you don't need to worry about installing them right some of the softwares that as you know installing them are really 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 challenging right but this is not true for everything and anything right for example spark out of the box they give you map produce out of the box they give you hive uh, hue all these apache relevant big data solutions out of the box they give you one two Uh, the one, uh, the three uh, VMs that I mentioned, by uh, JVM, Bio, and then uh, uh, Cloud Burst and um, uh, Crossbow. These are again biological uh, VMs, pre-built. Cloud Burst already set up for you. You don't need to worry about setting up path dependencies, etc. One click, it's it's boom for you. Same with Crossbow. Same with other things which comes with Blast to all these things set up, right? but if you are going to rent a computer in cloud and then on your own going to install and set up that is the same pain as installing in your local machine except except you get the benefit of only renting the machine right because you can like rent for example uh, 128 gb ram uh, for one hour and see how that helps which is not practical for you if you are going to buy it's going to cost you a lot you don't have that uh, sort of experimental thing to try so you you have the experimentation you can always perform low cost with like let's say 10 dollars you can very well uh, experiment with really large computing nodes and see how does that help you right but insulation as i said not everything is out of the box but there are many things that are out of the box so if you have any specific software that you are interested i can actually circle back and see hope i answered you yeah he convinced you thank you thank you very much uh, putesh shankar yeah excellent shit so see uh, yeah th th thanks to prash uh, and uh, um, thanks to uh, shubhagar uh, appreciate your kind words and uh, Uh, the the moderator um, I, yes. i forgot her name yeah thank you hey. sir thank you so much sir thank you so much for the talk and uh, hope uh, our participants really benefited out of it uh, so it's my pleasure to move to the next uh, keynote speech by uh, professor diniti peeris so professor diniti peeris obtained her phd in molecular biology in vitro fertilization and toxicology from the university of sheffield